who I'm glad you brought up Colt Keith because I actually uh, did some a little bit of research before today, I'm trying to get back into that. Uh, you know, when we had more structure when we had uh, you know during the season. You know, we have our segments and stuff, and so I like do a little research. And, and one of the things we talked about a bunch um, is is Colt Keith tends to start slow at a new level. Uh, which is not uncommon for any player, but I went back and looked. So I went and, and back to 2021 when he just first started in low A Lakeland. His first 14 games, he hit 191 with no homers, seven walks, and 16 strikeouts. And then over his next 33 games, he hit 404 <laughs> with a home run, just one. Still, he wasn't in for a ton of power there, but 26 walks and 23 strikeouts. So they bumped him up to high A West Michigan for 18 games where he hit 162 with one home run, eight walks, and 27 strikeouts. So he struggled a little bit when he moved up. That's natural. Uh, when he went back to West Michigan to start 2022, he was pretty good right away. He hit uh, 290 with six home runs over the first two months. Uh, and then he started June, the first six games of June, he was hitting 381 with three homers in six games before he got hurt. So he just started to take off, it seems. And we saw it again last year uh, a couple times. In, in 2023, his first nine, 10 games there in Erie, he was just batting like 225, only one home run, four walks, eight strikeouts. We I remember he he self-diagnosed that he was too crouched over, I think, or too hunched, or too too upright. I don't remember which one it was. Um, but the first month overall, he hit 286, which was great, right? Three home runs, eight walks, 22 strikeouts in 20 games. From then on, he hit 346 with 10 homers, 17 walks, and 41 strikeouts over the next 40 games. So they bumped him up Toledo. And, you know, he had a big splash there in the beginning in Toledo, home run in his first game, maybe his first at bat, I think it was. And then hit that 470-foot home run a couple days later. But you know, first 23 games, he's hitting 267 with three homers, 12 walks, 23 strikeouts. It's solid, but but not particularly special. But then over the final 44 games, 297 with 10 homers, 23 walks, and 35 strikeouts. So, uh, you know, they, those are all kind of arbitrary, but it, it's a pattern, right? It, it, he comes up, he struggles a little bit because it's a higher level, and he's always been young for the level. Uh, and then he makes adjustments, and he improves. And that's one of the things we like the most about him, right, is he's always shown that ability to make those adjustments. He, you know, he, he finds his footing. And obviously, you know, the next jump is the biggest one. So I would just, you know, caution people to give him a month. So is he on the opening day footing. roster and they go for the rookie of the I, year in the draft pick? Or? I, I think he is. I think he's absolutely on the opening day roster. We uh, That was one of the two questions we couldn't ask Ryan Garko was who's going to make the roster and who's injured, uh, which is totally fine. Um but just given the moves that we've seen them make over the the, the off season, they're holding the spot open for Cole Hafe. I, I I don't uh, unless he absolutely falls on his face in spring training. I think he's coming out of spring training as their second baseman. Yeah, um, I second. But again, I'm just just you know fans should give him a month to six weeks to, to to find his footing, and he may be solid for a while. He may struggle, but but he's eventually going to figure it out because he's that good of a, a hitter. Jake Rogers is up for an all star position or all star spot like that. Uh, what would be cons- Bass wants to know what would be considered a good first year for Cole Keith? You know what? Anything over two seventy five and twenty home runs. Oh, that would be great. Oh my god! I, I, I mean, you know, think back to. Oof. Yeah, I mean, I, I think two fifty with twenty home runs would be uh, on the upper end of of what you could expect from a, a rookie. Um, you know, if he goes and does that and he's playing adequate defense at second base, that's like a two, three, one season from a rookie, which yeah. would, would be pretty solid for, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, like yeah. the, we, we love the bat. We love the, the selectiveness, the, uh, you know, the power, the hitting ability. So just a matter of how, how quickly he makes those adjustments. Look, I mean, I know there's some, <laughs> wow, geez. And, and all that, but again, out of all the, if if Keith, for his age, what he's done in the Tiger system, he's done more. He's he's done it. He did more than Riley Green did. I mean, and, I, and if you're if you're talking like power and average, and less strikeouts, he did. He had a six for six game last year, folks. Something that has never been done in MLB, where he hit two home runs, and hit for the cycle. Mm-hmm. He and I, I it's just. One of those things where I know, I, again, I know it sounds like we're we're pumping him up. He might start off the gate struggling, but I just there's so many times where we, we when we talk to him and how much he prepares and makes the adjustments. I just I, I don't know why I've been so confident about Cole Keith. When normally I'm always I'm always skeptical, 
for people who you know it, the chance of him being overhyped bass i don't think so i mean if he was being overhyped he'd be talked about right now but he hasn't been among league circles or anything like that the tigers know what they have with them but they're just they're probably cautiously optimistic and detroit degenerate he'll be better than steven moya <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Stephen Moya, like, couldn't even, even in the minors, I mean, he hit home runs, but he never hit for average. He hit, like, 35 or 30 home runs, but would hit 246. But I think Keith, my expectations are, my, my realistic expectations, if he goes out there and hits 260 with 20 home runs, then I, I'd be happy with that. Or he just goes out there and gives the Tigers a solid second base. And he's definitely un- untradeable. No doubt. Cole Keith, if there's you know so, unless, yeah go ahead chris well I, just just to throw this out there i was just looking so uh you know you can you can look at the projection systems right now uh steamer has has colt keith uh hitting 261 with 10 home runs in 82 games i think 84 games Two, 260 with 10 home runs steamer uh can be a little bit optimistic but zips has keith hitting 251 with 19 homers uh over a full season of the bats um and that's uh you know those are both i think realistic um, they're probably, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to just automatically assume a guy's going to come up and hit big league pitching because we've seen it before where it just doesn't work. But I think those are realistic expectations, 250 to 260 with 15 to 20 home runs. Yeah. Yeah. 16 to 20 dingers, league average on base. I'd love to see that. If he was just even league average or slightly above an on base percentage, which means that that patience has come to the major leagues with him and just play a competitive second base. Uh, a second base to the point where you know you can stick him there and you're fine. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd, I'd be happy with that. There's just again the X. So we I'm don't not, think we're going to play the service time game. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's what I think. Because who else? I mean, okay, gonna have you're gonna have any Bi- or any Abayas there as a backup but just can, in case. You could play Andy Abayas for ten games. I mean, you could do that yeah. and bring him up and gain that extra year. I know everybody hates it, but business-wise, think, it makes sense. You know, I, I think that there's uh, – I think that the benefit of the potential draft pick for bringing them up – I mean, you know, you have to kind of thread the needle there. He has to be really good and, and win an award. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I think they believe in him to the point where that that's possible. And even still, you bring a guy up uh, – you know, few players – stay healthy for the full season, right? Uh, you know, right. there's a chance he gets injured. There's a chance, uh, there's a chance that he doesn't perform and you send him down to Toledo for a couple weeks and you get that extra year, uh, organically as it were. So I, I just wouldn't worry about it. Like, you know, if you're, if, if you believe in them and I think they do, then you just, you bring them, bring them North. You remember Jim Leland used to say, just give me the best players. That's how you end up with, with Zamaya and Verlander. And later on it's Porcello and Ryan Perry. On the opening day roster, um, <laughs> three out of four is not bad. Options. Yeah, so I think he's going to be one of their best hitting options. He's he's absolutely one of their nine best hitters right now. Yeah, he, yeah, d- fair enough. Yeah. I mean, it, it's to me, it's not even it, for all the offense they need to get. Yeah, if if it's two fifty and nineteen home runs, I'll take that because it's anything better than the alternative right now. What they have. But it's, I think I'm trying to keep my expectations realistic as possible. There will be struggles, but I just want to, it's, this is not the situation like no offense to the great Mike Gerber or something along those lines. This is a guy who can hit and has hit at every level he's been at. This is not just a guy that they're just calling, like he's forced the issue. He has forced the issue. And to me, that's just, for how long we've been doing this, I've never seen a guy hit that, like just mash the ball, just smoke the ball. Dal Dal Lugo was a bum. I'm sorry. He was a Who's bum. When Dal- Lugo? Yeah, somebody said remember him. Uh, remember, well, I mean, uh, Dal- Dal- Lugo was Dal- Dal- Lugo was was uh typified the the Alavila player uh acquisition strategy seemingly, which was find guys who can put the bat on the ball even when they do so to their own detriment. And that's what Dawa Lugo did. I don't think he hmm. – he probably had a strikeout rate under 20%, but probably walked 3 4% and, and wouldn't hit the ball hard. And it's – there was a great article in Baseball Prospectus the other day about uh, 
of Corey Seager and how he uh, was the best player in baseball at swinging at pitches he should have. Uh, and, and that's kind of the key. It's you know, Everybody loves walks, but you you have to swing at those pitches that you can drive. That's a huge thing. And um, mm-hmm. Tigers had a ton of guys who just swung at everything. It didn't matter. So you didn't have to throw him anything you could drive. So mm-hmm. Colt Keith is, is one of those players. He makes pretty damn good swing decisions. Like the, the one issue I saw with him in Toledo when he first got there and he was struggling a little bit was um, he was he was chasing, not, not chasing, but he was putting the bat on on pitcher's pitches pitches on the edge that, that maybe he can't drive as well. And he eventually got away from that and, and waited. Remember the game we saw, the Gibson Long game, he would just wait out. He waited. I think they threw him like two consecutive sliders down and in, didn't swing. They threw him a fastball and he had a home run. Uh, that was just the maturation process there. So 